My name is Stacy Shiflett. I'm the pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church, Dundalk, Maryland. Many of you know me. Many of you are my friends. I've got a lot of friends that are going to be affected by what I say today. Some of you have never seen me, never heard of me. I'm celebrating 25 years of ministry this year. I'm 45 years old with a wife and five children. I've been the pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church almost four years. I succeeded Cameron Giovanelli, who was the former pastor. And I've been a friend. I love Brother Giovanelli, his family. I've been a friend and a supporter of North Valley Baptist Church and Golden State Baptist College. Last semester, I think we had six students there. My daughter's there now as we speak. Just finished her third year. My son went to a, co a year of college there. I've preached. I've sang. I've been a friend of that ministry. We've supported that ministry for years here at Calvary Baptist Church. I have no axe to grind. I have no personal vendettas. The only reason I'm doing what I'm doing now is because there's an enormous amount of misinformation that's been spread that needs to be clarified. There's a lot of people taking positions on the allegations that broke last week concerning Cameron Giovanelli. As the pastor of this church where the alleged activity took place, I have been since last Friday investigating, cross-examining, gathering facts, stories, names, dates. I have an enormous amount of screenshots from personal communication between Cameron Giovanelli and the victim, Sarah Jackson, as recent as last Thursday while they were on tour up in Seattle. I asked Pastor Treber and the leadership of North Valley to handle this situation. I asked them to deal with it. I asked them to not cover it up, not gloss it over. And after seeing the statement that was made last Wednesday night from the pulpit of North Valley Baptist Church, I have no choice now but to tell you the truth. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 13, He that heareth the matter before he, he that answereth the matter rather, before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. Now, if I understand my Bible correctly, a person cannot draw a biblical conclusion about a situation until they have at least heard the facts. What has been shocking to me is how that nobody seems to want to know the facts. I've been dealing with this. My deacons and I have been dealing with this for days. And we arrived at a unanimous conclusion that the allegations were credible. The woman that told the story was credible. We have corroborated much, not all, but much of her story. As a matter of fact, the very room that I'm sitting in right now was ground zero, if you will. For much of the illicit and immoral and illegal activity that took place. This happened 12 years ago. Sarah was 16 years old. A senior in our Christian school. Her granddad, Bud Hall, was the principal. Her grandmother, Diane Hall, was the pastor's secretary. Both of those precious people are still on my staff, and she has communicated with them what she had kept to herself and hidden her heart for 12 years. The minute the story broke, I did not allow my relationship with Cameron Giovanelli, I did not allow my friendship with him, and I did not allow my friendship and my relationship with North Valley to influence my investigation. The reason why I'm so passionate about this, the reason why I'm putting myself out here today is because I know what it's like to be a victim. I was victimized as a teenager by a man, a preacher boy that was in a Bible college in the South that came through our home, spent the night, sexually assaulted and abused me in my sleep. 
He ended up going to prison, is now a registered sex offender. The reason why I'm telling you that is because I know what it's like to be a, a, a victim. But the other reason why I'm telling you that is because the Bible college he was going to knew he had molested children before and did nothing about it. Then later, as a 22-year-old preacher boy, still green, wet behind the ears, I wasn't even married at the time. I was dating my, my wife, Grace, but I was on staff at a church in North Atlanta as a youth pastor and a music director and an assistant. And the pastor there was white-headed, 53 years old, a man of of, uh, of, of, of well-known in the circles, uh, executive advisor boards for mission boards and, and a pastor of great churches, big churches with big, big ministries, big Christian schools and brought me on staff. And I was a little flattered by that till I realized he got me up there to take advantage of me. And one night in a hotel room, propositioned me. I told him no, obviously, and I resisted his advances. I carried that around with me for three or four weeks trying to figure out how do I tell people that me, this young preacher with no experience and nobody knows me, who's going to believe me against this man that everybody looks up to that had been pastoring for 30 years, but God gave me the grace and God gave me the courage and God gave me the boldness to confront him and bring him before the leadership of that church and bring him before the mission board that he was representing and to God be the glory and much to my relief, he admitted it. I was vindicated. So I've been a victim twice, and twice I've realized I was a victim because people that knew never said anything. Turns out this man had been abusing his young assistants for 20-something years, and none of them ever said anything. And here I am, a 22-year-old preacher boy just starting out in the ministry, having to deal with this junk. And the only person that stood with me was my pastor and my dad. And I ended up leaving that church. Nobody from that church ever reached out to me and said, we're sorry this happened to you. God bless you. Thank you for doing the right thing. Not one preacher ever contacted me. That man left that church with a three-month severance pay and went and became an administrator of a Christian school in another state. Me and my pastor and my dad drove there and told them the story. We said the man admitted it in a room full of men, in a room full of deacons, in a room full of people. He admitted it. We left that pastor's office in Greenwood, South Carolina, and that man that had done that was still the administrator when we left. It's been a policy. It's been the M.O. in fundamentalism for pastors and churches and ministries to just gloss over and sweep under the rug things of absolute epic proportion. The reason why I'm so fervent and so passionate about this this morning is because I relived all of those feelings of what it's like to be abused and the one that does the abuse is always the one that comes out on the other side smelling like a rose, go down the road to another church so he can do it again to somebody else. By the way, there's been two other people that have reached out to Sarah saying, I know you're telling the truth because he did things to me. One I have been able to corroborate and prove the other one has remained anonymous as of today. Bottom line is, I've got enough evidence on my phone. I've got enough evidence that has been gathered from current and past staff of this church to corroborate her story. And the deacons and I arrived at a conclusion last Monday after spending an enormous amount of time in a conference call with her and her husband. We arrived at the conclusion unanimously, this woman's telling the truth. We believe her. Or, to use the proper legal terms, this victim's story is credible. And I communicated with North Valley and the leadership there, and I have been trying to get somebody out there to reach out to me to hear the story. And the story broke on Friday of last week, and I only received a phone call from the leadership of North Valley on Wednesday, 9.30 a.m. their time, 12.30 my time. The conference call as far as I'm concerned, was only because I told Cameron Giovanelli Wednesday morning, I've got the evidence. I know it's true. You cannot fight this. They were trying to get him to fight it. He actually submitted his resignation on Monday at noon. I've got that on my phone as well. They did not accept his resignation until I threatened to go public with the facts because nobody out there ever asked for the facts. 
I said, if you don't handle this, if you sweep this under the rug, I'm going to tell what I know. But I'm going to give you the chance to control the narrative and do the right thing. It doesn't involve me. It happened 12 years ago. I was pastoring in Greenville, South Carolina. This was 12 years ago. This, is, this happened a long time ago. Well, if you heard their statement on Wednesday night after the service, what you heard was a complete, total debacle. It starts out saying that when we heard, well, let's back up. It says there have been uh, accusations of inappropriate conduct. Are we really going to refer to molesting, consensual or not, a 16-year-old girl for nearly a year? We're going to call that inappropriate behavior? I mean, that's the statement that you would use if you cuss somebody out in the parking lot. They, they, they minimized, downplayed the seriousness of the, of the allegations, number one. The next statement was, as soon as they heard, they put him on administrative leave, which is true. They pulled him off the road. He was with a tour group. Pulled him off the road. He wasn't at church on Sunday. Put him on administrative leave so that they could conduct an honest and thorough investigation, which is a complete, total lie. They didn't investigate anything. I didn't get a phone call, an email, a text message from anybody till Wednesday afternoon, my time. And it was a conference call with Pastor Treber and David Gibbs Jr. and another man from their staff that was there in the room. And the, and the, and the only reason why I believe they called is because I told Cameron Givinelli Wednesday morning when I talked to him, I said, if you don't walk in there and tell them to deal with this, and tell them that you're not going to fight this, that you cannot fight this, the evidence is overwhelming. If you do not tell them to fight this, I am going to tell everybody what I have discovered. I'm going to tell everybody what the truth is. Well, they called, asked me what was going on, what I knew. I told them. We talked for nearly 30 minutes. They got off the phone with me immediately went into a meeting with Cameron Giovanelli and accepted his resignation in no uncertain terms. But to make the statement from this pulpit that you conducted an honest and thorough investigation when you never called me, you never called a victim, you never asked a single question, is nothing but a complete and total lie. And I cannot sit back and allow this statement that was made from that pulpit Stand. Now, here's the bad part. The victim was watching that statement. All she originally wanted was for him to resign or be fired so he couldn't be in a leadership position to ever do this again. That's all she wanted. She was so re-traumatized by the lack of accuracy. She was so angered by the smoothing out and the... and the. There was not even a... a, a Statement to the effect of the, the allegations are even credible. It just ended with, let's pray for the Giovanelli family, let's pray for this ministry and others. No mention for the pain of the victim, no mention whatsoever of what she's had to deal with. Then the cameras were cut off, and the conversation from the pulpit then turned to, I owe Cameron Giovanelli everything, I love that man. And as of this morning, this is Friday morning, 11 o'clock, the rumors that I'm hearing, the vibes that I'm getting, people's take on this whole situation that are there is Cameron Giovanelli is the victim. Stacy Shiflett and the church there didn't handle the situation right, didn't give him an opportunity to defend himself, and that is absolutely not true. And I will not stand back and allow that to happen. I stood up for what was right when I was a teenager. I stood up for what was right and confronted cover-ups and sin when I was a young preacher boy. I'm 45 years old with five children. I've been in the ministry for 25 years, and it bothers me that men of God that will stand up in the pulpit all over this country and say, we're going to stand up and defend the truth and stand for what's right. They duck and they run and they hide when stuff like this comes out. And that's why people have given independent Baptists a bad name. It happens all the time. And it's not going to happen this time. Stacy Shiflett 
and the deacons of Calvary Baptist Church and the members of Calvary Baptist Church are going on record that we are 100% completely sickened by these allegations. We're sickened by what we've heard. We've done everything we possibly can to communicate to our church as much as we can where we're standing and how we, how we operate in this situation. But I will not be blamed for not handling it right when I couldn't even get anybody out there to answer a phone call, a text message, or return a call for days. I had, to, I had to threaten to do what I'm doing right now to get them to do what they did. My daughter's out there right now in college, just finished her third year. My staff members, a lot of them came from out there. Our relationship with that school and that church has been like this. This tears me up. This breaks my heart. I've never even laid eyes on Sarah Jackson. I wouldn't know her if she walked in the door. She is so hurt by ministry and pastors and churches that we've only communicated through phone and, and, and email. My lawyers have reached out to her and talked to her numerous times trying to find out what's going on. I've talked to her numerous times Staff members in our church, ladies in our church have reached out to her, people that's in our church now that knew her back then. They have corroborated the fact that they were in the office together a lot, alone, with the door shut, and that she had a cell phone provided by the church, and all these details that are deplorable, not to mention all the other text messages where Cameron Giovanelli has been keeping in touch with this woman through Facebook messaging for years. It's unbelievable that you're going to get up in the pulpit and say allegations of inappropriate conduct. And I will not stand for it. And it's high time that we men of God stand on the truth and the facts and what's right regardless of fear or favor or who it is. I don't care if it's your friend, your family, your own kids. It doesn't matter. Truth is truth. And I'm going on the record today with the full support of my deacon board, full support of my church, Stacy Schiff at Calvary Baptist Church is not going to allow this crime and this sin to be swept under the rug. David walked up to the nation of Israel as his soldiers were standing there for 40 days watching God's name being blasphemed. And David said, is there not a cause? He looked around at all these men that had better experience and better equipment and said, why aren't somebody doing something? What is, the, what is the problem here? And it's interesting when you read that story about David and Goliath, how that his brethren started accusing him of being proud. We know your pride. And I'm confident when I post this that people are going to start questioning my methods. They're going to question my motives. They're going to start making this about me. This is not about me. There's a cause. We need to have integrity and honesty in the ministry being more interested in crafting some legal statement with loopholes then just come right out just tell your people the truth you shall know the truth the truth shall make you free and what I've told you today is the truth if it breaks your heart I'm sorry if it makes you lose confidence in people I'm sorry if it makes you not like me I'm sorry but I told them if you don't handle it I will and this is how I handle it thank you very much